South from Auckland came our pioneer forefathers. They cleared the land, burnt the bush, made new farms and built new towns. But reaching the edge of the central plateau, the pioneers came no further. For a land without trees, a land without moisture, was an ominous sign. Four million acres of sterile wasteland covered with mounds of pumice lay across their path. While here and there, seeping up through fern and scrub, was steam, for the fire still smouldered which had once destroyed this land. Yet out of this burnt land, out through the barren valleys, draining the pumice land of its moisture, there flowed one great river, the mighty Waikato. And for some, this was a sign. Some believed that, given water, this sterile land could be made fertile, that fern and tussock covering the plateau could be replaced by grass and clover. Pumice is soft, it's velvety. Never sodden, never baked in summer. It should make good grass country. It should make good grass country. But failure met man's first attempts. Though grass would grow, for some strange reason it would not support life. Bones lay scattered across the plateau and men abandoned their farms. Financial houses refused to deal with pumice land farmers. What caused cattle and sheep to die, no one knew. But the whole of the central plateau was declared black country. In ages past, the fertility of the plateau, the forests which once grew here, were destroyed by layer upon layer of pumice shires thrown out in volcanic eruption. Not even a rabbit could live here. And in these first years of failure, only scientists stayed to work in the pumice lands. They found that for some strange reason, wild horses managed to live. What was it, men asked, horses did not require, that cattle so badly needed? Searching for a hint that might lead them to the secret, scientists carefully collected the many different types of pumice soils. These were tested and analysed. Rotokawa sand, Taupo and Rotorua pumice, black Tarawera ash. But years went by and scientists found no answer to their problem. No answer until one day out of the shadows came discovery. A missing trace element lay between life and death for animals of the cloven hoof and when mixed with bountiful supplies of phosphates would grow strong healthy grasses capable of supporting life. Such a minute amount was wanted for success it almost seemed ridiculous. A few ounces to every acre of pumice land. Yet cobalt was not the complete answer. One great problem remained. Who was to pay for the immense cost of clearing the land before cobalt, phosphate and seed could be sown? Who was to make roads and build houses? The answer lay also in machines to crush the scrub and immense capital investment. And only the government had the resources to do this on a scale big enough to settle thousands of ex-servicemen waiting to be farmers. Today, the Land Settlement Board, working through the Lands and Survey Department, is the controlling body established by the government to carry out this task. Their plan is one as big as the plateau itself. The old pioneer's dream of the central plateau cut with roads, with new towns, schools and dairy factories. A plan to greatly increase New Zealand's wealth by providing urgently needed meat and butter for Britain, milk powder for Asia and wool for the world. But first, the land had to be surveyed, measured and divided. Once again in New Zealand's history, the scent of scrub and fern was filling men's nostrils. A new pioneering spirit was abroad, spreading out across the pumice lands, gathering men towards an old job. Once again, men were having to decide what would make good dairy country, what would make good sheep country. 
men were gathering on the plateau, armed not with slashers and shovels like their fathers, but armed instead with modern means and modern skills, ready to change this barren land into a place of great fertility. 20th century pioneers came to the pumice lands armed with their machines, and the earth, which for 2,000 years had not borne fruit, was at last asked to deliver. the scrub will lie all during summer, drying out until the early autumn when it will be set on fire. Centre for these operations lies in Rotorua, the centre of a great tourist industry and itself situated on the volcanic plateau. From their Rotorua headquarters, the Lands and Survey Department control work going on all over the pumice lands. And behind Rotorua is the Lands and Survey Organisation in Wellington, administering New Zealand's land development projects. Ministry of Works engineers, acting through roading contractors, cut through the hills and across the plains to each new development area. Each year advances this great plan farther and farther into the pumice wastes. Each year sees another 60 miles of urgently needed roads. Roads which will one day carry the school bus, the cream truck, the farmer's family to a town not yet built. The needs of the pumice lands are urgent and enormous. Millions of fencing posts are required. A million pounds of grass seeds stored for each year's work. Special shipments of wire and piping from Australia rock phosphate ships with their cargoes from Nauru and Ocean Islands. Supplies of cobalt from Canada and sulphur from Louisiana. And these, when fused together, are transformed into a chemical of great possibilities. Transformed into cobalt superphosphate, which, when spread upon the sterile land, will stir it to new life. Without it, all would be useless. During the night, special trains are at work hauling these materials up to the railheads. Early each morning, hundreds of trucks haul the supplies across the plateau to contractors working in outback areas. put through the hills. All day it burns and long into the night. The earth is opened to the sun for the first time. Some of it ploughed, some of it giant disked. Day after day, the sodbusters climb and descend the hills, cross and recross the gullies. Thousands of acres being turned by man for the first time.
After the discs, giant chain harrows smooth the land, preparing it for the seed bed. Take three eight-ton wagons to the north end loading outline. Job one, two, one. Twenty tons of seed, comprising a mixture of rye, coxfoot and white clover. Any luck with the weather and we'll have this cut out by Friday. For Rotorua, Taupo. Weather clear and mild, wind freshening by tomorrow. This is Mixed in the machines, seed and cobaltized superphosphate go down over the pumice soils, over the rubbly taupo pumice, the black tarawira ash, and the rich rutamahana mud. And where country is too steep for tractors to climb, plains loaded with seed and phosphate dust the hills from the air. The seed sown, man must now wait for nature to play her part. And aided by man's bidding, nature will, in the fullness of her time, out of sunlight, air and moisture, bring forth new fruit from the once sterile earth. Using many thousands of fencing posts and hundreds of miles of wire, men must now fence in the hills and establish their claim to the land. And in pumice country, where there are few creeks or springs, the search for hidden sources of water goes on in many ways. Deep boring drills must often go down 300 feet before water is reached and brought to the surface. I'm at 50, I'm at 2 pound 10, 2 12, 6. Sheep and cattle have now to be bought and got to the young pastures as quickly as possible. For the battle with the pumice is not won yet. The land grassed, fenced and watered, sheep and cattle now do their work. Work as important as the machines which first cleared the land. Stock now keep down the fern, which would soon choke and destroy the young grass. Three years and more in places, the job goes on, farming the freshly won pastures and continuing to supply them with phosphates. For without phosphates, Without the magic trace element of cobalt, the land would die, and the stock with it. Carried out by lands and survey staff, these three years of farming helped to pay off the immense cost of clearing these areas. By late summer, sheep and cattle have begun their long treks over the hills to the distant railheads. Three times a week, four months of the year, Sheep and cattle trains go steaming out from the pumice lands, bearing away the growing wealth from these once despised areas. Preparations go ahead for those who will one day come and farm as individuals.
house units move along roads but recently formed. Power lines come in through the hills to meet them. Hundreds of miles of telephone lines are strung across the gullies, ready to link each isolated family. And everywhere, men are building, building schools for their children, butter factories, and extensions to old ones near at hand. Surrounding the great hydro stations being built on the Waikato, the Maori people have their own rich pumice land farms. Specially chosen men spend two years on training farms. And for these Maoris, settling on the plateau involves a heke, a migration from the Wairarapa district to a traditional tribal area of the Tuwhare Toa and Maneopoto tribes. Pākehā settlers also are busy migrating from different parts of New Zealand, transplanting their roots to the new pumice land farms. For each man, the next few years will mean plenty of hard work, subdividing his farm, increasing its yield, and paying off the mortgage. But with a farm he can call his own, a good house, and a good lady to run it, well, life's grand. Every year, 80 to 100 new families take over their farms, gather their herds and flocks, and begin their partnership with a new soil. All during the winter months, people are moving in. Then, with the coming of spring and the promise of summer, the magic of the land's fertility spreads quickly, down through the valleys and out across the plateau. Embracing each new farm, each new family. The great task is almost accomplished. Men who once served at sea, in Greece and Korea, now live at peace with their families under the clear skies of the plateau. Hey there, Tui! A big house for a man with no wife. A man's right now, got a cage, shouldn't have any trouble finding the bird. In scattered communities all across the plateau, settlers gather. new families people this once desolate region. These days, wherever you drive across the plateau, there's new farmland, yielding up the land's wealth and making the greatest single increase in primary production New Zealand's ever seen. And always, wherever you go, there's the throb of tractors bringing more of the gullies to life. There's over 200 miles of new roads. The whole face of the plateau is changed. Grass and clover has indeed replaced fern and scrub. New hydro stations, new settlements, a thousand new farms and a thousand more to come. The great dream has come true. Pumice is soft, it's velvety. It should make good grass country. It should make good grass country.